couple of tumble down a couple of tumble down or badly repaired shacks. And this picture is a, you know, kind of an idealized picture. He didn't arrive in a stagecoach, for example. He probably came in a wagon. Um, and the church probably had a different form to it. It was probably more of a double log cabin, but it was down, probably was down by the lake, which is called St. Mary's Lake. We kind of know where this place is today. But this was the founding of Notre Dame. And soon afterwards, he built another chapel Another log chapel a little further up the hill. So today, here's what that area looks like. And here you can see um, on the left, there's a road. And if we could go even further to the left, you'd see the lake. And there's a really nice lawn. And behind, the, in, looking straight back, there's some pine trees. They kind of hide it, but there's the, the reproduction log chapels there. And then on the kind of near left, you see a, another brick building. And that is called Old College. It's the first brick building built on campus. Um, it's always been rumored that this was made with bricks from uh, Notre Dame's own, it's the first bricks Notre Dame made. But a uh, graduate student of mine, Lauren Finnegan, has been studying brick production using um, X-ray fluorescence and other tests. And he, she is pretty much convinced these bricks were probably made somewhere else and they didn't have a brickyard at that time. The quality is like crazily better than any other yellow Notre Dame brick. So a little bit challenging Notre Dame history a little bit, but we worked a few field school years inside the area of this um, red rectangle that you see on the lawn. Now we have a number of um, maps of the campus. There was a company called Sanborn that made maps of cities and towns and campuses and farms that could be used for fire insurance purposes. So if you said your farm building burnt down, your barn built down, you'd be able to document you had a barn for these maps. But this shows the um, campus at Notre Dame in 1885. And you can see here. There's a little um, building here. That's the old college building right there that I showed you. It, we're kind of looking from here up to there. There's a old ice house here that I think maybe could have been one of the original, maybe the original log cabin or a shack. There's a slaughterhouse for pigs. Um, there's no log cabin up on top of the hill. That actually burned down in about 1865. And then there's horse barns and a farmhouse, a outhouse, another farmhouse, university bakery, some other sheds, a tool shed that becomes important later on in my talk. Oops. Um, so anyway, at this time, by the 1880s, this started Old College, the first building on Notre Dame's campus, kind of a multi-purpose building. Things then shifted to the main building, and they built a sequence of these main buildings. And the French style of education was to have everything in one building. And that was how Soren was French, and that's how they built Notre Dame originally. And this part of the university became the university farm. They um, raised livestock and did other types of things. So here's what it looked like in 1888. Not nearly as nice as the last photo I showed you. You know, um, so you can see, here you see old college. Here's the ice house which I think could be a repurposed log cabin. There's the pig slaughtering shed. We don't slaughter pigs on campus today. And you can see the new main building, relatively new main building in the background, and the basilica, which at that time does not even have a steeple. And then the lake today is surrounded by a road, and it's a beautiful place to go jogging and take a walk. walk. But at, th at this time, there was a pig yard here. And some fences, and the pigs could go up and down and easily refresh themselves in the lake. This must have been really annoying for the child. And this was probably, this picture was probably taken in this early spring. No leaves on the trees, wind from the south. You can't really see it very well, but there's a man fishing with a cane pole over here. So when the fish are just starting to bed. But things have changed, obviously changed a lot from that to this. Kind of a similar uh, line of sight. 
And the university continued to grow and change. And this is, um, in 1917, they totally reconfigured the area. They got, the university farm was closed and they took out a lot of the farm buildings, old colleges here. They made a reproduction of the, a long chapel that Soren built, which that's the one I showed you earlier that still stands today. And then they built a library. It's called, now called Bond Hall on top of here. In the 1970s, um, an archeologist named Jim Bellis that was at Notre Dame did a little summer a class where they did a dig one semester and they put in a few units by the log cabin uh, near this corner and they found a lot of artifacts. And that led to us doing a field school there in 1991. And we were able to verify, well, basically we were working in 1991, we worked in two areas. We worked by the log chapel. Here's that red rectangle. And then we had another place on the lawn where we did a magnetic survey, which was a relatively novel technique in, in Indiana archaeology in 1991. And we put we found a big magnetic anomaly. I'll show you that in a minute. Put in a unit. And then we had a control unit just to see what would happen. Because I mean we were trying to figure out how to interpret this magnetic data. So we're trying to do it systematically. So here's the unit by the log chapel. And yes, there was a lot of archaeology. Here's just a basic one by one unit that's nothing but a solid mass of bricks. And then this one shows about three, about a meter or three feet of deposited soil. You can see pottery and bricks, huge piece of iron, some more bricks. And this produced some, so many artifacts. It was a real pain in the neck to deal with them after the field school. It took like months to catalog everything. And that remains the case today. So we went back to the site in 2016 and did some additional excavations, really been 2015, 2016, um, and opening these units as part of this high school, two week high school dig. And that proved to be even, even though small of a scale, just uh, looking at a couple of units for two weeks, still produced a very abundant archeological record. So you can see um, some of the things we've got. Here we're cataloging the glass. We've got rusted iron artifacts and iron artifacts of all kinds. We had one level that produced 120 cut rusted iron nails, bags of mortar and other artifacts. A good range of pottery that we've got. Pottery that dates on um, this blue edgeware, dates from the 1820s and was you know, present at the founding of the university. This annular decorated is a bit later. You know, so is this mocha ware, maybe 1830s, 1840s. Pearl ware, or I just, actually an ironstone ware, it comes in later. The bottles, this is stuff that's post Civil War. Same down here, and just a huge plethora of stuff. We've got um, pottery that would have been used after the Civil War, clay pipe stems. Mason canning jar. Um, here's a bullet. Um, and here's a part of a gun flint flake. Down here, there's a, um, a clay pipe. And these are quite abundant. You can see the stems and the, um, and the bowls. And then, um, you know, those are really common items. And then over here, we've got, whoops, I'm sorry. We've got um, a heart from a rosary, the central part of a rosary. I've only worked at ever two sites where I found religious artifacts. That's Old College and the Pokagan village of the Niles Band of Pokagan, Pokagan Potawatomi Indians who were Catholic. Then a suspender clip or something, maybe a belt clip. And then another part of a gun shell. And actually to me, the most interesting thing about this is that these gun, gun ammunition, you know, we find some of that every year. But today, I mean, if, so they're firing stuff off all the time. Um, if you found that, if somebody fired a gun off on campus now, we would be in a lockdown. So it really shows this was just living in a different world. You know, the university farm was a kind of almost like a rural place where people did farm, rural farm activities from day to day. Very different than the urban campus now. So here's a map of the campus in 1899 before they um, re reconstructed. 
But here's a, you can see old college. It has some wings on it that aren't there anymore. The horse barn's still there and the other farm barns. Here's a farmhouse and here's a, a, a kind of an octagonal building. But I think is the tool shed that was up a hill. Then these other farmhouses, these are no longer there. But we think, um, I found this picture in the university archives. And I think it's this farmhouse. You can see the farmhouse is the right shape. Um, it's labeled on the back, Old College, but it's not. Old College has always been square. This building's rectangular. And then behind it, there's a thing with a peak roof. I think that's that tool shed. So I think this is the farmhouse that used to stand on the Notre Dame campus. And I think we've been investigating the remains of this farmhouse for the last four years or so. So here's a magnetic survey map we did in 1991. This is a really crude map. Our ability to display magnetic data was not very sophisticated back then. Um, it's a contour map. The peaks represent high magnetic signals or low ones. This is a really low area, rectangular low area. There's some highs around it. So this is the, we had this huge magnetic anomaly. And so we put a unit on the edge of it. So we don't know what's producing it, but it's pretty powerful. And here we have another magnetic anomaly, or no magnetic anomaly. This was our control unit. And I, we've got some better maps uh, with, that we've made with more recent software I'll show you in a minute. But in um, 1991, we're working, here's the control anomaly. And even that had a lot of stuff in it. We're working on this and it didn't show up. It was so overwhelmed by that giant magnetic anomaly. But there's a, you can see there's a lot of construction debris here. There's brick fragments and concrete and iron and wires of some kinds. And we found some little floor tiles. So there's definitely remains of a structure that was in this area, perhaps the farmhouse. But you can see what archaeology looked like the head here with some passion, passion in 1991. Uh, more recently, we did a, a reproduce the magnetic survey over a larger area using better software, which shows um, positive anomalies as red and negative anomalies as blue. And this goes from the top of the hill up here down to the lake. And you can see some things. There's a bench, there's a sidewalk that goes through here that has benches on it. Those benches are you know, prominent red and blue anomalies. Those are called dipoles. And they're characteristic of iron. Then here's the huge intense magnetic anomaly we found in 1991. It's definitely metallic and it's probably deep, relatively deep, because it's got a big positive lobe and it's separated from a negative, or a big positive lobe here, separated from a negative lobe. Then this is a pipe that's running along the lawn. And we actually know that because we have the utilities marked and they came in and they gave us a map and they showed us there's a pipe there, it's really big there. But you can see it's alternating uh, red and blue anomalies. That tells us the pipe has what's called chaotic protection. It's a way of um, putting electrodes on the pipe to protect it co from corrosion. And further down the hill, we have scattered positive and maybe dipolar magnetic anomalies. Lots of excavations to try to investigate the large anomaly. Because that's been the thing that's been bugging me since 1991. And unfortunately, um, you can see that there's some kind of archaeological feature in this area. These units are up in that anomaly area. Something here. And here's an area where something was excavated. And it looks like it was filled in with cinders or something, pool cinders. But our biggest problem was there are no trees there now or bushes. But there, this thing must have had a lot of vegetation on it because there's just a huge mass of roots. You know, it took us two weeks to get through them to get to this point. It soon became apparent that we would not be able to, in a two week field school, find the large magnetic anomaly. So its source remains yet un unknown. Um, I kind of wonder whether that tool shed wasn't like iron or something or tin, and whether they didn't just bury it in the house foundation when they tore the house down. It's a possibility but we just don't know. Maybe someday we'll have a bigger excavation and we'll get down. Here's the 
here's an anomaly a unit we placed, two by two unit we placed down in the southern part to test these scattered magnetic anomalies. And you can see right away, we've got um, kind of archaeological soils in here, and fragments of brick and other items that are producing these uh, single monopolar anomalies. There's some kind of scattered historic material there. So we focused on that area in subsequent years. Um, we also supplemented our work with ground penetrating radar. And this is me at a site called Collier Lodge in Porter County, Illinois, in Indiana, Porter County, Indiana. And I'm doing using a MALA ground penetrating radar unit, GPR. There's an antenna here that sends radar waves into the soil, collects them, and then a computer that controls the data. And I just push it like I'm mowing a lawn. It's like a silent lawnmower. I push it, I create a grid, I push it back and forth on this grid marked by the blue flags. And by doing that, we can gather like gridded data that we can use to make GPR maps that show us what's buried beneath the surface. One of the problems with the magnetic data is that it only gives you stuff within the top half meter and there's no depth information. Everything's just, you know, flat on a map. This gives you three-dimensional information but it takes a lot of computer process. So here's a radar gram. We take the GPR and push it along. You can see there's a lot going on in this thing. There's a, a lot of little um, reflectors of various kinds, something kind of shallow here, another shallow thing here, something intense and deep here, some kind of almost like a, a floor or something, or some kind of a, a stratum that's sloping here. Likewise here, and then some really intense reflectors over on this end that are shallow. And this was done at Old College. So I'm pretty confident we started from an area that had a lot of trees. These are probably tree roots. But these, this, I don't know, it could be geological, and, but this stuff definitely looks archeological. There's some kind of features there. And they show up, you can see, um, this is the horizontal scale along our transect. And then this is the vertical scale. So these features are showing up. The roots are showing up pretty shallow, but these are showing up about a half meter or less below the surface. Now we can take these individual profiles and combine them together into a cube of data. And that's what I've shown here is where you've got kind of a cube of these profiles right together. And then we can average those profiles and we can slice them horizontally. And here's an example of a horizontal slice where you could just like pick a depth and look at what's there on the flat surface. And I could take a look at that as a map from the top that looks more like a map. So if we look at the lawn where that farmhouse was, right away, you could see that there's some kind of rectilinear structure there. Um, there's some just miscellaneous enough, um, reflectors down here but there's a prominent linear structure here. There's some concentration of reflectors here, another linear structure. And we, these two actually are about the same width apart as the width of the farmhouse. So there's a good chance these could be part of the farmhouse foundation. I do not, there's kind of a thing here. I don't know what that is. That doesn't show, maybe part of, but it doesn't make sense because it's like maybe an interior partition of the farmhouse. We do not know what this is. You know, maybe it was a walkway or something, but it doesn't show up on any kind of a campus map from that era. We know it's not the utility pipe that's further up the hill. That if this is a wall, why doesn't it continue there? We don't know. But we're pretty confident. The first thing we did, and this is where we got to in our project, is we started testing this to see what it was. But here's actually, this is a little, I've changed the angle of it. I've turned it at a 90 degree angle. So it's gonna correlate with our um, excavation photo. So here's, um, here's that big anomaly or big reflector. And I've drawn the line of it there. And here's a unit we put in to um, in that general area. And you can see, well, this is the first unit that found those um, artifacts from the magnetic survey. But you can see along this edge of this unit, you can see a line of brick fragments right below the topsoil. See them more clearly here. 
that they're definitely not just random fragments. They've definitely been put out there in a line somehow, but they're not a wall, right? Because they're, they're not coherent in a sense of a wall. But perhaps they could be the upper remnants. You know, as you know, in Indiana, you know, right now we're heavy into our freeze thaw cycle. You know, anything this shallow is going to get moved around over time. You know, it's been what, about 120 years since they tore this building down. If they left part of the foundation intact, it could get scattered like this by just natural process. And here you can see that yellow line correlates with a line on the GPR signal that we think is the wall. So we're very confident we're looking at the upper part of that wall. Now we've continued to excavate in this area. Over the last two years, we've had to take our field school online. So uh, Dr. McLeister and I, and uh, usually a uh, student assistant, an undergrad or grad student, excavating in this part of the unit here. Well, looking at a little bit at the wall to try to expand that. So looking at this portion here, and it's turned out to be the soil when we put out a level looks like it's gonna turn into sterile subsoil, but it produces all kinds of artifacts. So it's definitely some kind of subsoil that somehow got mixed with artifacts by a process we don't understand. But on these historic sites, um, the movement of these kind of soils, um, there's a lot of movement of fill and mixing of all kinds of materials together. That's not uncommon. In fact, there's an archeologist called James Dietz who wrote a book called Small Things Forgotten that's become a classic. And this was in the 60s, historical archeology. span and he has a chapter that talks about how historical archaeology is different than prehistoric. And he says one of the main things about historic is you have to deal with huge amounts of fill, which is very rare on prehistoric sites, unless you've got mounds or something. But this you know, a soil here in this area still produces abundant array of artifacts. Some of them are recent. Like look, these things look like a little, they're like little glass beads, like something from the 70s, maybe 1970s. Um, another, um, we also find like coins from the 20th century and we find like pop pops from beer cans from the 70s, which, you know, tailgating or something or joining a beer before a game. Um, another heart from a rosary. Part of a, um, some what's called um, ironstone stuff that would have been like used after the Civil War. It's the kind, kind of pottery you probably would have eaten off of if you lived in a farmhouse in 1880. 1870. Uh, bottles from flavorings or medicine or alcohol, other types of glass. Um, this is really hard to see, but um, it's a little bit of a brown transfer print. That was where they would uh, print decorations on a pottery by transferring it from a, a metal plate to a tissue and then onto the pottery and firing it. This was produced in England, in Sheffield, England, and it dates prior to the Civil War. So you can see the older pottery is crunched up much smaller than the more recent, more durable pottery. So we've got a lot of different mixed stuff together and we're just have not gotten very deep on this. We're still trying to figure it out, but there's no doubt that there's an intact archeological site that can tell us a lot about life in the um, 19th century on the Notre Dame farm. You know, way of life that otherwise we know very little about. You know, we found a lot of medicines, um, all kinds of medicine bottles and all kinds of things. So we're gonna to continue to work on this linear brick feature this summer with our uh, summer scholars field school. So can we learn more about the farmhouse when it was constructed? So we don't have it, we have maps of it fully made, but we don't have, we've never found a document that says um, what year it was constructed in and what materials were used. Well, we don't, you can't see from the photograph what kind of roof it had, but we're definitely, we're pretty sure that it had a slate roof. Many of the early buildings on campus had slate roofs, and we find fragments of roofing slate, you know, in our excavations right next to the foundation of the building. So we're pretty sure it had a slate roof. We found some floor tiles in 1991 that were little octagonal things. They were kind of Victorian era tiles, so it may have had a tile floor. Um, other than that, we don't have a lot of data on it. We do find some really early electrical hardware, like insulators, and from the very, that would have been used when electricity first came 
the South Bend, the Notre Dame area in the late 1800s. And I think that was probably added to the building after it was constructed, but we, we think they had power there. And what did people do there? Well, we know they ate and they maybe took medicines or had some alcohol um, or they um, did other activities, but and domestic activities, but other than that, we're not really sure. And so far we have not found any evidence of farming or anything like that, but we know there was you know, farm, barns and stuff nearby. So overall, the big thing, there's abundant archeology, span got a typo here, sorry, from the founding of Notre Dame on and below the lawns. And it's funny today, you walk across these lawns and they're, you know, Notre Dame is really great groundskeepers. They keep everything perfect. You would walk across these things and have no idea there was three feet of our, or more of archeology span under your feet, unless we're out there digging. And the Notre Dame community is very interested in its historic campus. The, the, you know, they uh, valorize the main building and the log chapel. There's uh, buildings now that are, go up are made with brick that closely replicates or at least replicates the aesthetics of the yellow Notre Dame brick, creating a coherent campus look. But in general, they don't pay a lot of attention to conservation like archaeologists would. One thing they do not do is they do not do any, generally do not do any kind of archaeological investigations before they do some kind of construction. For the most part, that's not a problem because most of the campus was farmland and, you know, fields. So there's nothing in it. But in this old college part of the campus, there's clearly significant archaeology that could be, um, could be disturbed. So kind of raising the uh, conscious, archaeological con consciousness of the architect's office and the facilities people is one of the, kind of a side benefit of our project. They're much more likely to ask us if that imp there could be an impact from a project. So there are barriers to campus archaeology. I mean, two of them are you know just a lack of knowledge about it, and of course it's expensive. But there's also barriers from state law, in that Indiana defines an artifact as anything made before 1875. So much of the campus growth occurred after 1875 and wouldn't fall under Indiana's archeological protection laws. So that's, you know, so it's, there's no uh, legal incentive to protect things. But the old college does produce artifacts from prior to 1875. So that definitely deserves archeological protection at the state level. And I'll let, we've had a, this is a project that's been going on a long time. You know, I'd like to thank the Summer Scholars students, uh, people from Summer Scholars, the University Architect's Office, the uh, Congregation for the Holy Cross, the CSC, allow us permission to work at Old College, which is a seminary for uh, college students at Notre Dame who are interested in the priesthood, and then a variety of fields assistance through the years. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. You are. Uh, let me see if we got, do we want to put them in the chat window or we want to open it up to you? Whichever works best for you on, on these kind of things is fine with me. Okay. If you have a question, if you could throw it in the chat to everyone, and then we can address those questions. Um, I have a question right off the bat. I mean, yeah. Um, how do we get How do we get uh, involved in this field school? Well, it's kind of ironic. Um, we, we're probably going to do a different field school this year, not at old college. But um, hang on, I'm, I'm going to put a, a link in the chat. There's a site I worked at called Collier Lodge that we have worked at. Uh, we worked at for about, had public archaeology for project at for over 10 years. And we're going to do a field, and they've got this lot, it has artifacts on it from like 8,000 years ago up to the recent past. And there's a lodge building at the site that was built in the 1890s and it's ready to fall down. And they want to reproduce it and make a, tear it down and reconstruct it. So we're going to, they're going to tear that down this spring, and we're going to go over there and do some work on the foundation area that hasn't been accessible since 1898 to see, you know, if they'd be able to reproduce it in the same spot or if they need to move it. But if you know a high school student, you can send them to our stuff. But I'm going to put a link in the chat about Notre Dame's Archaeology Field School. And if you go down there, you can learn about the Collier Lodge site. You know, different site, but we'd be using the exact same techniques, a lot of geophysical survey, 
hand excavation. And the, the only big advantage of Collier Lodge site is it has much more also prehistoric artifacts. So it gives a little broader range of options. But if you're interested in learning more, and thanks for asking, Rob, um, here's, a, here's a link to our field school webpage, such as it is. Oops. There's the HTML site. All right. All right, anyone else have questions for Dr. Sher? Uh, Donna is asking if you have any projects in Ohio. No, I haven't done anything in Ohio. I have friends that work over there all the time and people that work there. Okay, it's interesting, Fordham University. So I can't help that with the Ohio stuff. And uh, I'm sure if you got in touch with, I know Ohio State University is doing, actually work in Indiana, but pretty close to Ohio, down in the Ohio Valley. So that if you're from Ohio, that'd be a place to check with. And maybe um, University of Toledo might be doing things in Northern Ohio. Somebody participated in a similar field school, Fordham, back in the 90s. That's another Catholic university. Was it... Uh, can I ask you, um, Damien, was it on campus like this? Um, did you find a building or anything? Can you hear me? There you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah, actually, that went off before I actually asked my question. Uh, so, yeah, it was an undergraduate class in historical archaeology, and we got to yeah, dig uh, adjacent to one of the oldest buildings, and it was a similar time period. And, uh, yeah, we'd, it was a great experience. We'd find all kinds of similar late 19th century things and we learn about cleaning stuff and cataloging things. The question I was gonna ask is this, uh, this dig and the class got shut down like 10 years ago, just cause the administration was sick of having like tarps on campus. Like it was huh. like purely aesthetic, like the, the professor, it drove him crazy. He constantly had to fight. And I was wondering if you have any challenges like that, like, Negotiate no. because it is such a beautiful campus that sometimes people don't, uh, <laughs> they shut down learning on behalf of having a nice lawn. I could see that happening. No, we haven't had not had a problem with that, but you know, the groundskeepers are there in their trucks waiting for us to get done. You know, they clean it up right away. We only backfill it and kind of rake it, but yeah, we have not had a problem with that. But you know, maybe I don't know how big the Fordham, how scale, big scale of the Fordham project was. You know, ours is kind of pretty small and. It looks scattered on the big field. So I think the impact of it looks a little more muted. Yeah, I think it was because it was it was pretty small, but it was central to like the nicest part of campus. And it was it was semi-permanent. It sat there for years. So like over the winter, they just tarp it up and yeah. Oh, I could see. Yeah, yeah, we would probably get in trouble for that. But what we do is we put plastic down, black plastic down in our units, and then we fill them back in. And so you can't see they're there. And then it's kind of a pain, but the next year we come back and we take out the back dirt and we just strip off the plastic and you can just start right up where you left off. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Yeah, great question. Hey, anyone else want to chime in? I got a question unrelated to this. Uh, yeah. Your work at, uh, is it Kankakee Sands? Well, we've been working over um, a place called Medewan Tall, National Tallgrass Prairie. Okay. And on the Kank and it's kind of related to a lot of work on the Kankakee Marsh. We've been working in the Kankakee Marsh. And the Collier Lodge is part of that Kankakee Marsh project. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what's your question about it? I'm just, um, I'm more interested in the Native American side of the archaeology. Oh, right. Okay. Sure. Um, basically, the main project, I mean, I've been doing this Notre Dame as a, a short field school, but the main part of my work for the last four years, uh, Madeline McLeaster and I have been working at a site in Illinois. There's a national tall grass prairie over there. It used to be the Joliet Arsenal, and they've turned it into a prairie. And we're doing a project we call the Canker Key Proto History Project, where we're looking at Native American activities right before the proto-historic period, which is the period right before historic contact. 
Okay. And we're going to a site called Middle Grant Creek. It's in uh, Medewin. And it's a, basically a prehistoric village that dates to around maybe 1600, 1650, somewhere in there. So the French don't come into the area in any kind of intensity until 1675 or 1680. So it's right before the French come in. And we've been finding, a, we've been excavating the site and it's full of these huge maze storage pits hmm. where they're digging these pits that are six feet deep and three feet in diameter and storing maize. And they probably had a village there with a population of maybe up to, you know, depending on how depend on the amount of maize you can kind of play around with how many people could have been there. Anywhere from 100 to 200 people for a decade or more. And they were doing this, all this maize corn cultivation right at the coldest part of the Little Ice Age. So that's kind of a paradox, you know, really agricultural at this cold period. And they had trading networks. We find early French trade goods. Um, and we find uh, Native American trade goods from this shell from the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera. So we're really trying to get, we're getting a, a much better picture of this proto-historic period than um, we had um, had before. Because there's a number of sites in the Chicago area that have been investigated, but they're all like salvage excavations from the 60s. And they don't, they're not like a modern excavation where you use geophysical survey, drones, flotation, all the stuff that we do today. So that's one big project. And we're still publishing on that and writing about it and giving papers on it. Um, then the Collier Lodge fits into that. And then it's got an earlier Native American occupation dating to around 1475 or so, probably. That's a precursor to these proto-historic, what we call Huber occupations. And one thing, one reason I want to go back to Collier Lodge is that we've been using the isotope ratios, oxygen and isotope ratios of freshwater mussel shells or clam shells to reconstruct the climate. And you can get a sense of the local temperature from analyzing oxygen isotope ratios of these shells. And I want to get more on um, mussel shells from the 1400s, very start of the Little Ice Age from Collier Lodge. And it also has stuff throughout the Little Ice Age. So any kind of shells we get there, and maybe some recent stuff too, that would give us kind of modern climate change signals. So that's another reason for us to go back there. And that's kind of my native, current Native American project. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, it's been a great, the middle Grant Creek has been a fabulous site. Got a great partner, Dr. McLeister, and we're, we're presenting, um, at the site, society, we present every year at the Midwest Archaeological Conference. And I'd be glad, we be glad to do a lecture on It'll break, break some time for your, for your group, too. Oh, definitely. We'd love to have you back. Yeah. Um, do we have any other? Oh, wait. Here's a question. Christine has a question. Uh, what other Native American sites in Indiana have you excavated? Any in central and southern Indiana? Well, yeah, I've done. Um, I've worked at the Angel site in southern Indiana. Um, that was years ago. I worked at a prehistoric village called the Stephen Steinkamp site also in southern Indiana. That was a Mississippian site. It was an outlying village from the Angel site. I've worked at a site called the Graybird site that's um, down in the, near the very tip of southern Indiana. That was a Middle Woodland Hopewell site. Um, it had a mound. I, we didn't dig the mound. There's a mound at it, but somebody built a house on the mound. I would have loved to look in their basement. But uh, we were looking. There's a village around this mound, and we were investigating houses in the village. Um, so it's a really interesting time period. And then central Indiana, never worked in anything in central Indiana. Uh, Don says he studied architecture at Bond Hall during this. Oh, really? Yeah, that was the architecture building until they built a new one. And he's, can you see his question or his, his post on your site? Yeah, in the seven, late 70s, early 80s. Oh, interesting, yeah. Yeah, so you wouldn't imagine all that stuff. You probably walked over this site many times and probably had no, and certainly had no clue about it. With the, Bond Hall has this terrazzo flooring. And we've actually found a couple pieces of it, like fragments of it that were like scrap in our excavations. And we found it, we didn't know what it was. And then one day somebody went in to use the bathroom in bond, basement of Bond Hall. And they came running out saying, I found the material. I found the material. That was pretty fun. <laughs> Do we have any other questions out there? Uh, 
Well, we have no other questions. Last call for questions here. Uh, go, please check out that link. So that link that you gave us, is that something just for high school students or college students? No, the link I gave you is just is for college students. Okay. Undergrad, yeah. And how Undergrad, does that... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I mean, like like uh, those of us at Purdue, uh, Fort Wayne, uh, we, we, we can do that? We can, we can... Yeah. Anybody can sign up for it. Um, visitors can do it. There's no, We don't have a, a special separate application. Pro, uh, if you go to the webpage, there's a link to the summer session. They handle all the applications. Um, we don't have a separate application process. Um, you know, we're willing to, and we, visitors are very welcome at Notre Dame on the Notre Dame campus in the summer. Um, Notre Dame kind of brags about its, how it's difficult to get into, but for summer session, if you're in decent academic standing with your institution, we're very happy to have you and anybody could sign up for this. There's an undergraduate version and there's a graduate credit version. It's a three week long field school, intensive, uh, you know, nine hours a day, five days a week. We'll be traveling back and forth to Collier Lodge and maybe doing some other stuff too. But yeah, anybody's welcome to sign up for that. Okay. All you students out there, take note. I know we have a field school as, as well this for up at uh, in Angola at the old uh, Civilian Conservation Corps site. Yeah, I saw that. That looks like a really interesting project to work on a type of site like that. Yeah. All right, lots of thank yous here, but uh, I don't see any more questions. So we're, we're going to uh, thank you for your time. You're very and, welcome. And we definitely want to hear about the Proto History Project. So we'll, uh, I'll be uh, emailing you about the possible future date we can book you for. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, we could get uh, Dr. McLeister to join us and do a, a we could do a joint, her and I often do a joint presentation. Okay. Where we talk, and that way we can each highlight, like she has a lot of skills in um, botanical analysis and landscape reconstruction. And is doing a lot of stuff with aerial photographs to relocate um, Original fields, Native American fields. So she brings that part of it, and I'm and I'm doing kind of more of that chemical analysis of different materials we find, and then we both do the archaeology and kind of cultural history. So with both of us, you can get a really interesting, you know, really broad scale program that builds more than the strength of one person. And she'd be, she'd love to do it. That sounds you know? great. I'll okay. be uh, I'll be emailing you. Yeah, please do that, Rob. All right. I'll look, Thank for, you. I'll look forward to hear from you. Now tell right. her to expect a, a call to talk. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You have a great day. You too. Thank you so much. Go, go Irish. Yeah, go Irish. <laughs> go Purdue. I'm a Purdue alumni, by the way. Oh, that's great. Yeah, from I went to West Lafayette in the 70s, but yeah, so I have a lot of, lot of I've been to two great Indiana universities, three actually, because I got my PhD from Indiana. Okay. But Purdue, went, got, I got a great education from Purdue. Well, thank you so much, and we'll be seeing you again soon. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye, everyone.